Hello everyone and welcome to the Scientix webinar titled Start to STEM. My name is Noel Billon and I will moderate this session. With us today we have Professor Wim Dien, I hope my presentation is okay, and Mrs. Zerda Somers. Professor Wim Dien is full professor at the Electrical Engineering Department of the University of Leuven. His technical specialization is Integrated Circuit Design. He is also involved in several projects focusing on the improvement of technical skills and insights of pupils in Flemish schools and teaches two courses about specific didactics for technical education in secondary schools. Professor Wendy N is coordinator of the SBO project STEM at School, which is a large-scale research project funded by the Flemish government. We also have Mrs. Yara Somers, a graduate graduated in mathematics in 1985, 81, sorry, and has been a teacher in mathematics since. She has been actively involved in projects focusing on innovative didactical method and on the exchange of learning materials, for example, in East and MELT. Mrs. Gerda Somers was involved in the standard school project from the very beginning as a co-developer of the learning materials and as a STEM coordinator at Eligard Institute Valley. Starting with a short introduction today to the educational principles of the STEM at school pedagogy, the presenters will illustrate how these principles were implemented in STEM at school modules. In a dynamic format for the webinars, they will offer schools a roadmap to implement STEM at school and thus challenge students from the 9th, 11th grade for STEM disciplines. The presenters will highlight some of the scientific results of the STEM at school project. And finally, they will discuss the prerequisites and possible constraints for a successful implementation of the STEM at school. My colleague Adina in the Scientix account will be helping you with any technical problems you may have. So please write to her privately if you experience any difficulties in attending this session. Please remember to turn down your cameras and microphone during the webinar. At the end of the session, we will have 15 minutes in which you will be able to address questions to our experts through the chat, but you can still post them during the whole webinar. Please remember that if you want to receive a certificate, you will need to fill a feedback survey, which will be shared after the presentation. Only participants who attended the webinar and filled in the survey will be able to receive a certificate. That is all on my side. I will leave the floor now to the presenters. Enjoy the webinar. Hello, Europe. This is uh, Wim speaking. <coughs> uh, together with Gerda, as announced by Noel, we will introduce you to our didactical methods and to STEM at school. Uh, but before we do that, we would like to know uh, who you are. So please use the POTS feature of uh, the meeting system and uh, fill in like three things. Uh, first, what is your profile? Are you a teacher, researcher? You see it on the slide. Uh, what's your major? What did you study basically? And which country do you come from? Yeah, it's always nice to know who you talk to. Let's hope this works. I'm looking to the person who is helping us here out to see whether things come in, Maripol. Shall I go on and do it a little bit later or? Okay, uh, there seems to be some technical problems with this. Never mind, we go on. Huh? This is not the most essential part of the meeting. Okay, so the presentation is uh, split into four parts and then a discussion. First, I will introduce you to uh, what is STEM at school. Then I will go on with why would you want STEM uh, as I define it uh, in the first place. Next, Gerda will take over to make it much more concrete and tell you about the experience she, have, uh, she has at uh, her school. And then together we will tell you a more like a practical roadmap if you would decide to uh, engage on this. So what is STEM at school? Uh, we, for one of the conferences where we uh, actually won a best paper type of prize, uh, we made a kind of a pitch movie, a kind of very so short summarizing movie, and I think there was no better way to, uh, there is no better way to show you 
watch time at school is also to introduce you to him by showing them moving. And now I again look to my technical assistant so that she can start. The movie is like a couple of minutes. Over the past decade, there has been a fast growing shortage of STEM professionals. Yet, young people's interest in STEM declines with age. To improve students' knowledge and attitude towards STEM, STEM at School has developed learning materials by integrating different disciplines. The starting point is a real-world problem, for example, a safety issue in a museum, but it could also be a mobility issue or an energy problem. Students work together, they apply key concepts, and end up finding a solution for the problem. The learning materials have already proved to be effective. In the end, students are more involved and achieve better results, and teachers and researchers learn a lot from each other. And that's not all. Thanks to the training course for teachers, new materials will be developed in the future. Okay. If I can have my slides back, voila. So this was, uh, the last minute was like STEM at school in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, and I will give you a little bit more detail and insights in that. Yeah. So first question is, why would you start to do STEM or to start STEM in your school as described more or less in the little movie? Um, a first argument, and I'm not going to do the full analysis of this slide, but the internet and the newspapers are full of it, there is definitely a shortage in STEM professionals. And with STEM professionals, we not only mean highly skilled engineers with the one or two PhDs, but also uh, operators for all kinds of machines and people who can do welding and drilling and, and installations and so on. And this is for different disciplines, different all over Europe, but it's general all over Europe we have a problem with the number of STEM professionals we have. So that's a good reason to have more of them, uh, economical reasons. But if you look at it from the point of view from our youngsters themselves, uh, a classical reference in that game is the Schoberg, uh, or the Rose study, sorry, by Schoberg. It's a Norwegian study that interrogated 15-year-old um, uh, pupils about their interest in science and math and so on. Rho stands for the relevance of science education. That relevance thing will come back by me. And this is a very uh, thick document. It takes a lot of time to read. I actually never read it. But there is a very nice uh, summary of it uh, based on the kind of graphs which you see now on your screen. And the, the question which was asked is in the upper left. In this case, I would like to have as much science as possible at school. And then depending on the country, uh, uh, pupils said, the average pupil said yes, then it's on the right, uh, said no, then it's on the left. The red dots are the girls, the blue dots are the boys. And what you see is, especially for the developed country, and the developing countries are on the top, for the developed country, um, they don't care. Well, that's basically the summary. The developing countries, they are always happy. As long as things move forward, it's okay. But that's not the subject of the presentation today. If you ask questions about pure technical context, the boys are there, the girls, yeah, maybe for computers. If you take petrol or diesel engines, forget it, uh, you lost all the female population. Um, so from the first two slides, you can already see that, that the attitude towards science and technical for the 15-year-olds is rather low. Um, on the other hand, if you go to things which are more relevant for their own life, things like uh, social, health, biomedical context, you see that definitely the girls are interested. Yeah? We should care about our environment. Also, the boys think that. Uh, the social the health thing is a bit less on the boys' side. But it's not that our youngsters or our youth, they don't care. They just don't care about science. Um, and there is a big contradiction in the perception. Huh? If you ask them, can I influence what happens, uh, in most of the countries, they say, Yes, we, we can play a role and we are motivated to do so. But if you then ask, like, can science and technology in general, STEM, do something about environmental problems? The answer is no. Yeah. They don't see a link between the problem, if I generalize it, between the problems we have today and the uh, science and uh, math and, and technical stuff. So, 
Yeah. If you then ask, do you want to become a scientist? Obviously, from the previous, uh, the answer is no. Boys are still interested uh, in technology. You could have seen that a couple of slides ago. So they are interested in technical things. Um, anyhow, uh, more from the systemic side. Um, we call that uh, the boys and their toys phenomenon. As long as it moves and makes a lot of sound and so on, then, then they are still interested. And that's why we still have boys in, in engineering, luckily enough. But the perception problem is not a contradiction problem. It's not a gender problem, sorry. So the first key word in my story is relevance. Yeah? We have to demonstrate to our youth, to our youngsters, that STEM can make a difference for modern social problems. You see there a little list, sustainability, energy, aging population, and so on. I'm, of course, not going to claim that this would be pure technical or scientific problems, but what I'm claiming is that at least these problems have a technical dimension and that scientists, engineers, mathematicians should come to help in uh, at least partly solving this problem. And we should make that clear to our youngsters that this is something which can happen. A key factor and that also shows from our research, is that STEM is in practice always interdisciplinary. It's not the math that solves the problem, it's not the scientist, it's not the engineer, it's everything together. And thus, if we want to show the effectiveness of STEM, we also have to show the interdisciplinary aspect of that. And that's how I come to my second keyword, which is integration. Yeah? We have to let our pupils experience how math, science, engineering, STEM does, cooperate to solve technical problems, make new products, invent innovative services, and so on. A first step, especially in the Flemish system, is that we have to bring math and science closer together. Now, there is a bit of a tendency to, to avoid mathematical equations in, in science teaching, which creates a huge relevance problem. So we need some new educational vision on math, science, and engineering, yet, we have to maintain the current still relatively high. Yeah? It's good standards in math and science. Yeah? Math and science in Flanders is more or less okay, but we have to maintain that, yet go a step further. And that's why we call it I-STEM, yeah? with a little blink of the eye to the iPhone, of course. But I-STEM stands for integrated STEM, yeah? where we bring all the letters of STEM together. Make no mistake, this definitely does not mean that we plead for cancelling or whatever, math courses or science courses or, or, or technical courses, whatever. All these courses have their own role, their own culture, and they should remain in place. But the integrated dimension where all these disciplines come together should be added to the picture, also in general education. Actually, this was a whole explanation for something which is actually extremely simple. What I did in the last 10 slides, I could have probably have done in only one slide. In the sense that in the last decades, uh, our society has become more and more dominated or influenced by technical things, by scientific things, and so on. We even call it the information society. Yeah? And STEM plays a more active role every day more. The actual question is then, how would it be possible that we can prepare our kids for that society if we don't educate them in all those STEM influences? Huh? And that's why STEM integration is a key factor. Huh? I mean, we just have to catch up with what socially happened, and that's basically it. We use the acronym I-STEM because, I don't know how it is abroad, but in our country, STEM is used for a lot of things. Everything which has a little bit of science or math or technical involved, uh, people give it the STEM label probably because it's sexy for the moment. Yeah? Um, we want to use the I-STEM acronym because that... Uh, clearly shows that the added value of doing STEM is in the integration and not in the components as such. These components are fine already. So our overall goal when we started the project is actually to de develop a new form of education, a general broad education based on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, showing the relevance of STEM for the modern society, and also addressing the interdisciplinary cohesion of that thing. So this is not about educating scientists or engineers or mathematicians two years before university starts. No, this is about giving people a broad education but founded on STEM, showing the relevance by integration of STEM. 
this is of course a very huge task and in the end it should involve every pupil yeah now for the first research trying to evo uh, involve or trying to address every pupil is over ambitious and usually when you're over ambitious you achieve it. you don't achieve anything so we limited the scope of the project to stem for future stem professionals we addressed those curricula in secondary education in Flanders which exist which already have quite high levels of abstractions in um, math in science and so on for the people in Flanders we didn't make a distinction between general education ISO and technical education TSO we took the most abstract mathematical uh, curricula being Wiskunde Wetenschappen, sorry for the Dutch, and Industrielle Wetenschappen alone. Yeah. So the STEM for everyone, where every pupil, pupil in the end gets exposed to integrated STEM aspects, is an open research domain. That is something going on, and at least we didn't address it. This brings me to the point where I uh, give the floor to Gerda and she will explain how my nice high-flying theoretical ideas in the end had a landing strip in the Heilighart Institute in here. Gerda. Hi everybody. Uh, I am a teacher in Heilighart Yeah, that we cannot hear you well, actually, here. Can you hear us? Yes, is it better now? Yes, better, you can continue. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Gerda Somers. I'm a teacher of mathematics in the Heilig Hart Institute in Heverlee, which is a secondary school in the center of Belgium. And we offer a wide uh, variety of study programs at all levels. And we implemented uh, STEM uh, as a, sc a school subject uh, for three hours a week for boys and girls who are eager to study uh, about maths and sciences. And I will tell you how we implemented STEM. Um, I will uh, say something about who is following the course of STEM. Um, how we implemented it, something about the teacher's team, and also some uh, results of it. Um, I start with the 15-year-old boys and girls. Uh, they have uh, STEM sciences, and they have five hours of math, six hours of science, and they have a uh, choice between three hours of STEM, or they can choose for uh, sports or some uh, different topics. But when they choose uh, three hours of STEM, then they are um, getting three challenges. The first one is uh, safety at the museum. They built uh, an, a museum uh, on one square meter, and they have to make a polygon to um, protect the precious object. And they do it uh, by making a, a laser um, polygon. And then the, uh, the second is an, an autonomous driven car. There are some traffic lights, and they um, know how long the green light will be on. And so they have to program and design their car so that it uh, goes uh, autonomously through the traffic lights. And then the third uh, project is a rehabilitation uh, device. For the 16-year-old boys and girls, they have the same study program, so they have five hours of math, six hours of science, and then they can also sh uh, have the choice to um, do three hours of STEM as a school subject. And uh, their challenges are uh, making a throwing device because they study quadratic functions. Um, and then the second is a roof truss and they have to make it um, a circular one because they learn about the tangent lines to a circle and they have to calculate where that they can attach their uh, roof uh, on the truss. And then the third uh, is um, they are making uh, the underfloor heating for uh, their house and they are uh, building and designing a sauna collector to do so. 
Then we have the 17-year-old boys. They have um, one uh, hour of math extra a week. They have also six hours of science and three hours of STEM. And uh, the first um, trimester, they are um, learning and studying the culture and the harvest of algae. Um, they uh, learn in mathematics uh, about exponential functions, and so uh, this is a good practice for that. And then the uh, second um, uh, goal is uh, in the observatory of uh, La Palma from the K Leuven. They uh, got the data from uh, a double star, and the big question is what is the mass of that star, and is it comet? coming towards us of going away. And then uh, in the last year, um, we started five years ago. So uh, uh, at this moment, there are not 18-year-old boys and girls, but we are planning it for next year. They uh, have also uh, six hours of math and six hours of science. And they are going to monitor the living environment. So the uh, uh, what are they monitoring? For example, the energy consumption with the fluxometer and the quality of the ambient air. And uh, they are also joining um, a Boss Online project, where uh, that's a project that measures the influence of trees on the quality of the air. And uh, a citizen science project, Leuven Air, uh, where they, um, the citizens of Leuven can um, uh, measure the air in their, uh, on their own front door. Um, so our pupils are going to join that project also. Um, then we are going to see it broader. We are going to do something about climate change. And for example, we are going to make a model of the Gulf Stream. And then um, as a final project, they will do something uh, real. Uh, that can be uh, useful for society. Uh, that's, in a short way, what uh, the challenges are. How do we realize that uh, challenges? Um, we are giving them a, a, a challenging, challenging assignment. Um, and uh, we thought that it was important that uh, the curricular elements from that year were uh, involved in the project that they could do some teamwork. And um, uh, we uh, were inspired by the book of Perkins, playing the junior version of the old game. He uh, told, or he said in his book, that um, it's important for the motivation of uh, young people that they can do uh, all the thing from the beginning to the end, and uh, not only the boring parts but that they have to do a junior version of the game. He compares it with a basketball game. So we decided that STEM should be a bridge between um, maths and sciences. For example, when uh, pupils learn in mathematics about the straight line, then they can uh, learn in physics about the light. Or for example, in mathematics, they can um, learn about functions, and in sciences, they see something about philosophy, and so on. Um, we think that the strength of the different uh, school subjects and the structure that they learn in uh, mathematics and in sciences uh, um, is very important. Uh, but the, the motivation part of the challenges uh, is also very important. So theory and challenge are one. For example, when they um, may uh, design the autonomous driven car, and you can see on the slideshow a picture of the boys who have recycled a toy and have made a, a, a new wheels uh, on, and, uh, underneath it. Uh, but they also have to uh, see uh, in mathematics functions of the first degree, because they need that for the velocity of the car, uh, the gradient. They uh, need the axis along the axis. And uh, in physics, they learn the position of the axis. And uh, with position, they can uh, calculate the velocity. 
For example, the uh, culture and harvest of the algae, uh, I already told you in mathematics, they have to, um, I, I'm a little bit too fast. Yeah, in mathematics, they learn about the exponential functions and they learn to calculate logarithm and then uh, when they are monitoring the growth of the algae, they see that is uh, a logistic function. They also learn something about biology and chemistry because they have um, um, making, they are making their own growing medium uh, and uh, they are studying what's in a plant growing medium and so they are monitoring the growth. They can choose for themselves which, which topic they want to measure. For example, this year there were some stu students who wanted to know if the color of the light has an influence of the growing of the algae, so they built uh, a box with green light, uh, red light, and blue light in it. Green is not good. Uh, white light, uh, red light, and blue light in it, because the algae for themselves are green. Um, and so they choose for themselves what they are going to measure, but they have to do um, the theory and the challenge. Uh, and then the next slide. Uh, that's for uh, next year, monitoring the living environment. There we uh, based uh, energy consumption and quality of the ambient air. Also, Bosnian online city and science is uh, statistics in um, the MET courses, uh, formulation and testing of an hypothesis, linear regression, and in uh, physics um, or geography, they learn about temperature, energy, and weather. Um, and then the broader um, climate change and the model of the Gulf Stream, we are going to use differential equations and in chemistry, salt concentrations and in physics pressure. pressure. So theory and challenge are one and then they are going to make a final uh, project uh, upon a real demand. So now I'm going to tell you how we started it, uh, some things about the teacher's team. Uh, the headmaster five years ago um, uh, uh, organized a meeting for all teachers, science and maths, and he gave some info and uh, told us what he would like to do about STEM. And then uh, the, the teachers had to uh, applicate for the job of STEM teacher. And that year we started um, a year in advance and we were scheduled free for one afternoon a week. There were four people that year, Jos, Peter, Nele and myself. Jos and Peter are both engineers. Nele is a bachelor in physics and I'm a master in mathematics. So you can see that we are a multidisciplinary team, uh, not only in our uh, main topics, but um, also um, in our background. Um, that year there was not yet decided who uh, will teach, um, but the advantage was that it could be uh, every one of the four of us. And uh, we got uh, financial support for the materials, but um, that, was, that was all. Uh, it was our enthusiasm that uh, made it possible, I think. So then, um, now we have... Uh, more teams, uh, we have uh, a team for the 15 year old, there is an engineer, a, a bachelor in physics, a computer science uh, was, is given by a master in economics and um, it is implemented two times two hours a week. So there are, uh, it's co-teaching, there are two teachers in the class, um, we have three hours of STEM and one hour of computer sciences, uh, what is um, mixed together. Uh, the same for the 16-year-old girls, two times two hours a week. Um, then the 17-year-old girls there, it is combined with one hour of uh, physics. And the same for the 18-year-old girls. And the, um, the uh, teacher teams are always uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, you can see that for the 17-year-old girls and boys, for example, there is a veterinarian in the team, 
um, when uh, each team is uh, supported by the math teacher because the math teacher must know what the topics are that uh, uh, projects uh, involve. And then some uh, results. We see that the motivation of the students is much higher than the in the classical way. The content retention is uh, much better. Uh, they ask the teacher uh, of mathematics, when are you going to explain this or that? Because we need it in uh, the STEM. Um, and both the teacher and the pupils have an increased enthusiasm. Uh, I have um, also put some problems with put some photographs of the of some other anonymous driven cars um, the rainbow is one that the girls team uh, has made uh, uh, but it works perfectly and uh, the other one is a fire truck uh, that's also a girls team uh, but uh, some teams have mixed boys and girls. Not, there are not only boys teams or only girls teams. The teams are mixed. Uh, we can see that workload is um, higher than in um, the no normal school topics, but it, it is because of the fact that the students are uh, more enthusiastic and they want to do more than um, we ask for them. For example, when they are making a rainbow, then the challenge is to um, make the wood um, uh, make the arch, that the wood can make the arch. And if they uh, made something of a straight line, that they have, don't have that problem. And they want to paint it, and they have to do that on Wednesday afternoons. But the theoretical part remains also an, an essential part, so they have to concentrate on both the hands-on and on the theoretical um, issues. So now I'm going to tell you something about um, how we, uh, what the ecosystem is uh, of uh, the STEM at school. Uh, I think there are three um, things that have to be uh, fit one to another, that is the, the school context. Uh, you have to make teacher design teams who have, are interdisciplinary, and you have to uh, integrate the curricula of the other uh, STEM of uh, sciences, technology, engineering, and maths. And how uh, can you do that? So, um, the teacher design teams, in fact, are the key. They should be organized in a team that is cross-disciplinary. Uh, for example, maths, physics, chemistry, geography, biology, um, as needed for the project. If you need geography, then it's interesting that you have the expertise of a geographist in your team. Um, it's also interesting that the teachers have a mixed education background. For example, uh, the uh, bachelor uh, teachers have more um, didactic uh, qualities, I think. They are more involved with the well-being of the pupils, and the master students pay more, um, uh, from the master teachers pay more attention to the content, but the mix of both is ideal, I think. And you um, have the expertise of, of both uh, teachers. Um, the team is also the key for um, the preparation of, uh, of the construction of the project and of the teaching material. Um, and then co-teaching is definitely an asset, but is, it is expensive. In our school, uh, we have uh, two times two hours of STEM. Um, and um, the four hours uh, are co-teaching with two teachers, but um, the school doesn't pay eight hours of STEM. Uh, it pays six hours of STEM, and the other hours are uh, volunteered. Um, then in uh, STEM at school, the team was made even richer. Um, they added uh, PhD educational researchers to the team. 
So this uh, facilitates the outside the box thinking and um, the, the linking and implementing of educational research results and also the linking to the technical context in the university. And now I'm going and to now give, now uh, give the word again to uh, again Professor Wim de Haane uh, because there is an action plan on how to uh, develop the ISTEM with CODEM, but he knows much more about it because it's the project from one of the PhD researchers. Okay, thank you very much, Gerda. Um, indeed, uh, as Gerda already mentioned, this was in the end uh, part of a research project. So we had several PhDs, educational PhDs, so engineers making a uh, PhD or scientists making a PhD, but not on some scientific or technical subject, but on an educational subject. <clears throat> and one of the outcomes is a methodology, um, we, it's, uh, we call it CODEM for ISTEM, which stands for Collaborative Online Development of Educational Modules. Uh, the PhD in question is named uh, Jolien de Meester, but of course it's also part of, of what happened in all the rest of the project. Uh, and on the right you see a very condensed way, uh, unreadable way, of the whole flowchart of the methodology. We have a, an online tool which supports that. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, some more detail on the next slide. Um, and a whole description of the methodology is uh, coming as we speak in the sense that uh, Jolien is writing her PhD, which will explain all the whys and hows and so on of this methodology. And I'm going to go through it. I mean, it would like be uh, two seminars on their own to explain all that, but well, it's not that much, but it would take much more time here. Um, and I will go through it as the bird flies to give you an impression and an indication of how this all works. This is, uh, Kodam uh, has a three or four phases for, um, and it starts with a context analysis phase. Uh, who do you target? Uh, in which context are you operating? And, and is this uh, clear? Each phase, and sometimes also within the phase, contains like checkpoints. Uh, did we finish everything? Are we sure that we addressed this, uh, the topics we had to address or the questions we had to address? Are we sure we did that sufficiently? Yeah? And there is a coordinator of the team who, when everything has, when everyone in the team has given his or her opinion, can uh, go to the lock uh, and unlock the thing and then we can go to the next phase. Uh, this sounds a bit rigid, but the point is, just to have checkpoints and like not skating through this. We also use it as an educational tool uh, to educate uh, teachers in training uh, on this kind uh, of stuff. I don't know what happens here on my screen, but I'm just going to go. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, the second phase is uh, the team selection. Uh, basically, what kind of content uh, are we going to address? Is this about uh, Algae or self-driving cars, so to say? Well, not really, because that's already the project, sorry. I'm making a uh, confusion which you cannot make. This is more about learning content. Um, I made the classical mistake myself now. Um, it's about learning content, so which of the curricular team do we want to address? What are we going to link to the project? Then. Um, you have to form your team and so on. And what you see is that with every phase, I don't know, can, can they see my pointer here or uh, not? But no, but on the left of every box, you see like out underscore something and, um, and in underscore something and so on. On the left are uh, inputs uh, from a previous phase. These are files and the system has a way of managing those. And on the right are the outputs from that phase. So we kind of prescribe of course, you're free to follow the methodology as close as you want, but we prescribe kind of several outputs which you need to have to go to the next phase. And the next phase is then the brainstorm phase where there is some research on which kind of content do we have, how can we find the necessary challenges, uh, that's more development and so on. And you see in the blue uh, round rectangle, you see again uh, checking points on is this okay and so on. And we heavily advise, uh, whether you do all the files detailedly is, is not always so important, but we heavily advise to make sure that you have answered the questions in the checking points before you go on. If not, chances are very uh, high that you end up with material which is not really suited or which does not uh, address the integration issues 
and so on. This is the second part of the brainstorm phase, again, with a lot of checkpoints at the end. This is a very crucial phase if during the brainstorm we, we don't have sufficient ideas and you don't get things all right, you're probably off for the development phase, which is going to be a bit of a mess. No. And then we come to the last phase, that's actually a relatively classic phase, uh, where, where the real teaching materials uh, for the, which you uh, use to address your students and so on, will be created. I just want to highlight one more thing here, and that's the script writing. It's not so, especially not for the scientific math and in some context, the technical context, that we reinvent all the didactical materials. If we are addressing a mathematical team which has been very well addressed in classical mathematical handbooks, we just use them. Why, why reinvent the wheel if you already have one? Um, but then we write a large script for the project, saying like, okay, this is how you address the challenge, make it clear to them what the challenge is. You need to gradually introduce this kind of content, you can find it in this book, then you need to introduce this kind of content, and sometimes, because we're also introducing more engineering things which are less classical to teach, there are holes in that. Stuff which you can't find in a way which can be digested by, digested by secondary school students, um, and then we write our own didactical material. Uh, a classical example of that is, uh, Gerda mentioned uh, a project about heating a house and, and controlling the temperature in a house. We wanted to teach some stuff about um, control theory at that time, and there is not too much control theory courses, or there are not too much control theory courses uh, at that level, so we developed one for our own, and this can then hook into the script just like all the other teaching materials can. So if you look back to the ecosystem which uh, Gerda revisited and the school context, the teacher design teams and the integrated STEM curricula, we put CODEM for ISTEM next to that, or CODEM for ISTEM next to that, as a way of guiding the process. Huh? I'm sometimes a bit afraid that people will see this CODEM model as a target. It's of course not a target, it's a means uh, to guide your project and to address things in a structural way. Because setting up ISTEM things is a huge challenge, it's interdisciplinary, you have to marry content with challenges and so on. If you don't do that in a bit more structured way, then probably a lot of the goodwill and the enthusiasm will fall on the stones and, and nothing really happens with it. Um, if you want to do this, feel free, we would, uh, of course, much love that. Uh, you can take a head start because for grade 9 and 10, STEM at school already published the materials. We got a lot of help from scientists from that. Thank you, guys. Um, and grade 11 will be added soon. Why is it not yet there? Because this material is still under test uh, and we want to do little updates and so on. But by the end of the school year, let's say in a, in a month or two from now, uh, we will be able to publish that too. These modules are not final, 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 but they have been used, they have been tested, they already survived something. Yeah? So I invite you to have a look at them, uh, make them your own, change whatever you want, keep the ISTEM philosophy, please, and share them somehow again so that the number of projects and the quality of these projects becomes even better. Oh, sorry. Um, if you have more, inf you want more information, you can click on these links where they are. That's, I'm not going to read that. So this brings me to uh, our final slide. Um, whoa, this is uh, moving for some reason. Uh, I wish that you can enjoy the journey as much as the destination. What I mean with that is what your student makes is, of course, fun. And then whether the, the car or the LGI system or whatever works is, of course, very important. But it's even much more important that um, the way they get there is uh, helps them to solve problems, to enjoy math, to enjoy science, to enjoy the technical stuff. So I think we all together should give our pupils the STEM educations they deserve, they are entitled to. Let's give them the tools to tackle tomorrow's challenges and I'm 100% convinced that you all can start to STEM and that we give you an indica indication of how to do so. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, than me, we will be more than happy to take your questions. Thank you, Werner. Thank you, Yerda. Uh, it was very interesting presentation, and I saw that a lot of participants were reacted. Um, so I received a lot of comments. So for the participants, feel free to post any questions uh, that you may have after the presentation of our speakers. 
So I have um, so I had a lot of comments. Uh, one from Ariana uh, saying that she liked the way that math and science and sciences were integrated. And um, we also had one comment from uh, Iskrika. Uh, how many students are in one team? So you mentioned the team. That's a question for Gerda. How many stu students there are? In, in one design team. One design team. Uh, uh, four, three or four? Uh, three, three or four, four students, students uh, per team. We have a, a class from uh, 24 students, and they are divided in six to eight groups. Yeah, that's also the experience we have. If you make it too small, there is not enough peer-to-peer -peer teaching, I would say. If you make it too large, you have like people falling out of the boat, hitchhikers and, and so on. Okay, thank you very much for the response. I also have one question from Gemma. Have you have they had the intention to include the companies as part of the STEM projects? Girls and boys will have direct contact with professional making science, according to her. This is something which we did not heavily do yet. Uh, it's definitely on the wish list to do so. Um, if we would get more chances to do that, we definitely would. The, the problem which you generally have with that is that it's very difficult to get it beyond like the occasional visits to a company which is then often more than marketing show uh, rather than something uh, which the students can learn about. So it's very difficult to actively involve uh, companies and, and make it such a way that it really helps them uh, to address their challenge rather than illustrate uh, yeah. what the challenge is all about. Yeah, I agree with that. We have now um, started uh, contacting some um, uh, firms and um, our students are going to uh, explain their projects to uh, one or two technicians and I think that uh, when they um, explain what they are making, that's also a part of STEM that is uh, communicating about science um, and so they can do that, but it's very difficult to find a real cooperation. Thank you, women. Yada, for this answer. I also had um, one question from Mariana. How do you assess students' learning? Aha. That's the one million dollar question, yeah, which we uh, didn't um, include here. Um, I'm going to give you the blunt answer and then the more scientifically founded answer. The blunt answer is you have to rely on the judgment of your teachers who follow up the process. Yeah, uh, That's of course a bit subjective and, and that's hard to structure. So we have another PhD which is still a little bit more in the development, still it's also running to its end. Um, where we uh, try to make this kind of scoring grids and, and scoring criteria uh, to do all this. Um, now, if you look to literature, it's about, it's actually about process evaluation. Yeah? Product evaluation would then be like how much, how good does their car work, but that's not so really important. Um, process evaluation is even at the university level a very difficult thing to do. Yeah? Um, so the, the, the thing is, the thing is complicated, but maybe Gerda can, can give a bit more concrete comments on, on how they do it in Helegaard. Yeah. Um, uh, in our school, the pupils have to uh, make a plan each lesson um, and in the beginning of the lesson, uh, the teachers are picking out one of the groups and that group um, must come and tell what they have done the week before, what they will do that lesson, what they will do at home and they have to explain their plan and they have also to explain which difficulties they have theoretically and with their hands on. And so mainly the evaluation is based on that, we call it a one minute presentation. And each lesson, each lesson of two hours start with one minute presentation of one 
group uh, once they are started with the project. Does that, does that answer the question? Yes, I think. Um, thank you, Yada, and thank you, Wim, for the for this. I think it answers perfectly. Um, so I also received also some further questions um, for Yada from Romalda. Uh, she would like to know um, how many school students are attending STEM in your schools. How many are attending STEM? So maybe this is a quite general question. I will answer that. Um, in STEM at School, which is a research project, and too bad, but it's running towards its end. It's only a couple of months ago, but it's still going on. We had like uh, eight to 10 schools, that depends a bit on how you count, and, uh, but eight to 10 schools which actually participated in the development of the teaching materials. And the school from Gerda is obviously one of those. On top of that, we had another 20, so in total, let's say 30 schools, uh, who uh, also tested the material. It's obvious that the schools who developed also used the material, but there are schools who were not in uh, the developing process, but kind of uh, got the material transferred to them, and then they tested the thing too. The big challenge we have now is with all the nice stuff and, and the teacher teams and, and the cooperation models and call them and so on we have, is to get it in the more uh, standard curricula of the Flemish education system. Um, and to use a very much understatement, that's a um, uh, Mount Everest which we still have to um, climb. Yeah. But I'm quite sure that the majority of the schools we were involved and where it went rather well, there were also schools where there were some problems, it's not all sunshine in, in this, but the schools where it went rather well, and that's, obvious, that's uh, luckily enough most of them, uh, are on the road and, and whatever the system says, I don't think they're going to stop. <laughs> but 30 schools is basically what we had in standard school. Thank you for the clarification, Swim. So that's all for the questions. I think there are no more uh, questions on the chat. Uh, we will wait uh, one more minute. We have very nice comments from all the participants regarding the presentation. Thank you again, Yerda and Wim. So I think we can also recommend now the participants to check the modules, then the resources that are published on the Scientix portal. And I will also advise the, the participants in this webinar if they want to uh, receive a certificate uh, that they have to fill in the, the feedback form. So Adina uh, shared the link on the chat. And uh, I will check again if we have any questions. Mm, so no further questions at the moment. Let's see. Actually, really clear. So, thank you, Wim, and thank you, Yerga, for giving us information about the, the STEM at School project. It was really interesting. And um, and uh, thank you again for uh, hosting our webinar today. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Europe, for all the nice comments. Uh, it's really reassuring for us. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening, everyone, and thank you again for your participation to Scientix webinars. Bye bye.